Brothers and sisters, the Israelites that easily conquered the city of Jericho suffered a defeat in the small city of Ai because God left Israel on account of a single person who committed the sin of disobedience. Only after Achan's sins were removed from Israel, God was back with Israel, and immediately Israel achieved victory. One of the mistakes that people are inclined to make is that they fail to figure out God's will while they are busy doing God's work. Then, what is God's will? As said in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. It is for us to be holy. What seemed urgent and important to the Israelites was to take more of the Canaan land quickly, but in God's sight, their turning away from sins and maintaining holiness was more urgent and important. It's the same today. Even if you are given many titles and busy sharing the gospel, visiting others, etc., there is a more important thing. Even if your spiritual eyes are open and you see the spiritual realm in depth, to obey, God, to obey God's will is a priority. It is to constantly reflect on yourself, cast off sins and evil, and pursue peace and sanctification with all men. Otherwise, you cannot bring God joy. So, so, no matter how many works you do, you are void of essence. You should first purify your heart, receive the Spirit's guidance, and wholly obey the way, wholly obey the way God wants. Only then can you abundantly bear good fruit in all affairs and glorify God as well. Today, I'll speak about how important it is to discern God's will before achieving God's work and how God works for the people who conduct themselves according to His will. I hope that all of you will figure out all the words you hear today in the inspiration of the Spirit, engrave them on your heart, discern God's will in all affairs, and show full obedience. As you do so, I pray in our Lord's name that God will be glorified greatly and quickly guide you to the land flowing with milk and honey. In the last week, as I explained, just explained, whatever is happening, in, did you, have you applied a message in your own lives? You have your prayer subjects. You want to see senior pastors soon and you want to fulfill God's providence quickly. That's what we've been praying for. But, just as I explained, Father God demands us something first. It is holiness. While senior pastor is not around us, we have to check how much we have sanctified ourselves, how much achieved we have achieved it, or how much we have uh, cultivated the words of truth taught by senior pastor in us, and how much we have obeyed accordingly. Achan is not now. If we if we disobey the words taught by senior pastor, we are just like Achan. As we look back on ourselves like this, we can receive His answers and blessings in the most appropriate time. As I look back on myself, Father God has always... I, was, I always wondered when Father God would answer us, when s i n a p a s t o r would come back. But what Father God wants from us first is to remember the words taught by shepherd and achieve sanctification and how much we... That's what Father God demands us first. But we have failed to achieve them. Yes, Father God gives us... Father God will send us back the shepherd with the completion of the power of creation. And we have to pray for that unceasingly. But... What is more urgent for us is to achieve sanctification and to resemble, to have holiness in our heart. As we do so, none of us should be like Achan, but all of us should obey 
so that we can receive all the answers and blessings from Father God. Even though the pastor accomplishes the completion of the power of creation 100%, the blessing cannot be ours. We, we say we, we miss s e n a pastor, but that doesn't... Each and one of us should become sanctified. That's what Father God wants us. And this is the time, I, this is the reason that s e n a pastor, that's what we have to do first. We have to examine whether we have longed for sanctification and achieved holiness and quickly obey. Brothers and sisters, after the Israelites conquered the city of Ai, they proclaimed the law of God on Abel and Gerizim according to Moses' command. They camped in Gilgar and prepared for the next battle. But one day, some strangers visited their camp asking for a peace treaty. They claimed to be a tribe from a distant land. They said they wanted to make peace with Israel. having heard of great power manifested before Pharaoh and the king of the east side of Jordan. God warned the Israelites never to make peace with the Canaanites because he was concerned that they would come in contact with Canaan's corrupt customs and get stained by sins and evil. But God permitted the Israelites to make peace with people from a region located far away from Canaan and offered to serve them without having a fight. These envoys, these people didn't just request a peace treaty, but presented various evidences of their having come from afar. They said that they claimed that they were not one of the tribes that God told them to destroy. And they also presented evidences. The bread which which they had allegedly carried with them since their departure had become crumbled and their allegedly new sacks had worn out. Their old white skins had been mended here and there. they looked shabby in their worn out clothes and shoes because it seemed clear that they were from a region farther than Canaan seemingly it would be okay to do as they wanted how did Joshua respond? and how Joshua should have done the Bible says So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for... So Israel took their provisions, but they did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them alive. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. They came for a peace treaty, and they claimed they were not one of the tribes of Canaan. They had come from afar for a peace treaty, and they said they heard about God's power, and they were frightened. That's why they came for a peace treaty, and they asked them so, presenting their evidences. As Joshua and the leaders of Israel looked closely at them, they seemed to be true, And without asking God, they made a decision for themselves and made a peace treaty with them. They promised not to kill them and made peace. But in fact, they hadn't come from afar. They were the Hivites, one of the seven tribes of Canaan. Gibeon, in which they lived, was not far away from Gilgar, where Israel's camp was. and their crumbled bread and worn-out clothes were all false evidences to back up their lies. Joshua, uh, this was only the second time Joshua made, made a major mistake. In attacking the city of Ai, he arrogantly made his decision at will without asking God about that. So many people died and God was dishonored. Even though he repented and conquered the city of Ai, he again made the same kind of mistake. 
Before making peace with them, he should have first asked God about how to deal with this. If so, God would have notified him of their falsehood. Even if God hadn't directly told him, He would have given him awakening so that he won't be deceived. Even even as we roughly look at this, we find the Hivites with too many mistakes. Let me share just a few. Because they said they'd heard about God's works and about Israel, they must have already known which land Israel was to conquer and what tribes God commanded Israel to destroy. God commanded Israel to conquer Canaan and utterly destroy its tribes. Then, did people living far away from Canaan have any reason to make peace with Israel? They claimed to have come from afar, and they had no reason to make peace with them. For a peace treaty, they had to kneel down, submit themselves, and accept Israel's demands because they were not equal in power. They had to lower themselves. They had to promise to serve them. And they had to accept the demands. If Israel had asked them to give them tribute, they had to do so. They had to accept their demands. But if they were really a tribe, they were living far away, they had no reason to make a peace treaty. If they had really come for a peace treaty, they were representing their nation, but they were far from looking like representatives. If they had really come from afar, they would have expected their clothes to wear out and prepared extra clothes to change into. Expecting to meet another king, they would have made sure to bring fancy robes. They wouldn't have needed pathetic excuses like, our clothes have worn out from a long travel. There were also other flimsy tricks, but as he just considered it a blessing for free, Joshua failed to notice it and made a mistake. Three days after making peace with them, Joshua realized that they were the Hivites from Canaan. By this mistake, the Israelites couldn't attack the land they were supposed to take. but it was already too late to regret it. We have to apply this situation to ourselves. Whenever you make such mistakes, what you should do, suppose you are in that situation. Some people may say, because I was deceived by someone into making a promise, it's okay to break it. But what's already been promised or vowed especially before God, must be kept. Others say, I made a vow because I didn't know things well. Now we are talking about this situation, applying. We may make vows before God and make promises with other people. Depending on how we keep those promises, we can be helped by God or we can become a person of liar and cannot receive God's help. Even after you make a vow, you easily break it and then you say, I made a vow because I didn't know things well. I was driven by the atmosphere. It wasn't by my own will. But God said, we should, ne- you should, we should never do that. Not just our vows to God, but our promises to others, once they have been made, we have to keep them, even if it doesn't benefit us, but causes us damage. Joshua did so. And the Bible gives us such lessons. Our God also makes sure to keep His promise. This Father God never wavers and never changes His mind. This gives us a comfort. Who changes? It is us, the human beings that change our mind. Have you departed from God's love? But once you go into His Word, you can again receive blessings. Our God is faithful and never breaks His promise. If you believe in such God, 
and live just like Father God keeps His word. But those who don't know the truth misunderstand that even God changes His mind after making a promise. They wonder like God did promise the first generation the blessing of Canaan flowing with milk and honey because they failed and died in the wilderness. Didn't God break His promise? But whenever God makes a promise, He offers to do something under conditions. For example, when He promises to bless us, if we carefully take a look at His full statement, we find conditions like, if, even if I promise this to you, you have to pray until you see it fulfilled. Only then will it be fulfilled. We, have, we can find out there are such conditions. If you want to know, we have to... Every word has its pair. A word in the Old Testament has a pair in the New Testament. It is a great blessing that a true servant of Father God clearly presents the conditions and if we keep them we can receive amazing blessings thus if you pray with faith to the end meeting the conditions for his answers and blessings God will bless you at the most appropriate time at the best time But after you receive a promise, if you just remember it, neither asking Him nor preparing the vessel that He wants, it's only natural that His answer doesn't come. Some church workers, they say, I received, God said this in a prophetic word. And if you look at Take a look at the prophetic words. God always says with a condition. But those people, many of them say, they just, they only accept the words of blessing in it. They only quote God's blessing in His prophetic word. They say like, Father God promised to bless me. Father God blessed me to promise to exalt me. But if for that to be realized, they have to meet the conditions. And if you meet the conditions, His words will be realized. You shouldn't be mistaken. You have to remember the conditions. Father God does not, never breaks His promise after He makes a promise. It is human beings that breaks our covenant with God. And we have to thank such faithful God. Have you failed to receive answers and blessings? Have you... There is a reason. As you get counseling from pastors or church workers, if you repent thoroughly, you can experience God who answers and blesses you. When people ask me to pray for them, but there's no use of my praying for them unless they repent. If they repent, Father God works for them. There is a condition. They should have no wall of sin. What they had to do first is the wall of, find the wall of sin and walk the way of light. And then if they receive prayer, they can be answered. We have to remember the conditions. I urge you to meet. Also, you shouldn't misunderstand God. There, is also, there are always conditions with His judgment as well. 
Judgment comes upon people for their living amidst sins. When Father God declares the words of judgment, God says, because you did this and that, judgment will come upon you. But if we stop doing that, His judgment will go away. That's why we shouldn't pass judgment on anyone. If there is a person who is in suffering because of his we shouldn't pass a judgment on that person. No matter how much a person has sinned, even if he is on the way to death, once he repents and turns back, God forgives him. This is His love, justice, and truth. We have to look at people with the eyes of the truth and the eyes of God. Then we can unite with all people in love. Even when, even when an evil king like Ahab tore his clothes and fasted and bitterly repented in sackcloth, God forgave him. Thus, we should have misunderstand God, not knowing the truth well. Even though Josh, Father God does keep His word, and He promises with conditions. By keeping this in mind, I hope you meet God who answers and blesses you. Even though Joshua was deceived by their falsehood because he'd already vowed before God to make peace, he couldn't reverse it. This is a truthful heart of a man of God. They made a mistake, but what they promised and what God has heard, they put it into practice. Even though he was deceived into making a promise, because he himself made a mistake, he decides to keep it. He let the people from Gibeon alive, but he had them serve Israel as slaves, cutting wood and carrying water. We can draw a few lessons from this single incident. First, you have first in all affairs, whether big or small, we have to ask God what His will is. We shouldn't be like, this is trivial, I'll take care of this personally. But we should acknowledge God, rely on Him, and ask Him in all matters. Church workers, I ask the church workers to run the church, the run church, not private way. We shouldn't deviate from the will, God-pleasing will. We shouldn't please men. Throughout the history of my men, we have learned how we can please God. We have to set a standard based on that. In our life, we should set a standard based on the truth. We shouldn't involve men's thoughts and think like, when we make a decision, we have to make everything God-centered. But we have to find out what, how we can please God. And we have to make sure that we don't deviate from His will. And s e n a Pastor has always taught so. Based on that, we have to conduct ourselves. We shouldn't say like, we, we can change this. We can In everything we do, in every decision we make, you know, Joshua made a mistake by not asking God. We should never let this happen in our life. Also, in our accomplishing God's kingdom, we have to do, we shouldn't deviate from, we have to be careful not to In doing so, we can do everything in God's will. It's not that Joshua disobeyed God intentionally. 
But before he, he, as God's children, you get to make various deals with worldly people in your workplace or business. We have relationships with worldly people. And there are cases where evil people attempt to deceive you in pursuit of their own benefits. Suffering loss by being deceived is totally different from pursuing goodness and seeking others' benefits. This is the reason that Jesus told His disciples to be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. When you make decisions based on what is visible and man's thoughts, we cannot figure out others' plots, thereby being deceived. There are many falsehoods out there in the world. There are many deceivers. Living in such a world, you have to be wise. Then, even though you see something something is beneficial, You have to commit things to God. Even though if you make a decision based on what what is visible and what seems beneficial, you can have a trouble. Especially when there seem to be benefits at hand, you believe others more easily. But if you are inspired by the Holy Spirit with a good heart, you get wisdom from God. Then, even when others try to deceive you, you can figure out their trick. Even if you can't, God gives you a way to avoid it. While you live in this world, while you have relations with worldly people, but if you stay on alert in prayer and make yourself trained to hear the voice of the Spirit, then you can keep yourself from being deceived. and keep yourselves from suffering a great trouble. Father God will present a way to avoid such things. But if you have greed or selfish desire, you make a decision based on what seems good to your eyes. You have to... You should never let these things happen. The second lesson we can learn from Israel's mistake is how important the words of our lips are. The Bible says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The peace treaty which Joshua was deceived into making by the Gibeonites served as a snare later on, and Israel suffered a disaster. Now, Joshua was having them as slaves, and Joshua let them alive. So there wasn't a big difficult. The only difficult was that they couldn't take the land that Father God told them to take. But later on, that became after Joshua's... This happened during David's reign, long after Joshua's death. As Israel suffered famine for three consecutive years, you know, this happened during King's reign, during King David's reign. So David inquired about this, and God replied that, This resulted from Israel's having broken the vow to the Gibeonites. David's predecessor, Saul, tried to destroy the Gibeonites among Israel, thereby breaking the vow made during Joshua's time. But during King Saul's reign, Saul tried to destroy them. The retribution came as famine during David's reign. It came as a famine. And as David saw the situation, he wondered why that happened. And as he inquired about this to God, God explained that Joshua made a promise with the Gibeonites, but 
사울 왕 때에 그 약속을 어기고 너희를 죽이려고 한 일이 있어서 너무나 미안하다. 그럼 이거 어떻게 해야 겠느니 And according to the Gibeonized man, Israel had seven people of Saul's offspring killed. Only then did the famine stop. Like this, we have to bear responsibility for the words of our lips, especially for the vows made before God in any way or form. In Judges chapter 11, we find a person who brought great distress upon himself because of his words. He was Ifta, one of the judges of Israel. As he began a battle against the Ammonites, he vowed that if God gave him victory, he would offer the first person to welcome him back as a sacrifice. Why did he make such a vow? Because the battle seemed impossible to win. That's why he needed God's help. And he made a vow. In your life, you want to receive an answer and you know you want to be used by God and you want to go to a better trans place in heaven. But, and then you make a vow. But, it's not that you also long for a duty and receive the duty but you even in your trouble you don't know why and you can, cannot find a way to escape it there are some church workers who you have to be careful with what we say to God We shouldn't make vow easily. We shouldn't make promises with people uh, randomly. When we seek some kind of blessing, we make a promise. But if the Holy Spirit inspires us so strongly to make a vow, if we make that vow, it is a blessing. If you feel inspired by the Holy Spirit to make a vow, but We ourselves make a decision to make a vow and and we make a vow and keep it. We may have our problems resolved. You know, Ipta, as he made a vow before a battle, but he made a wrong vow. But Father God knows that he would keep the vow. That's why, just as he vowed, God gave victory to Israel. Expecting that one of his servants or maids would come out first, Ipta made that vow. Of course, such a vow shouldn't have been made. He, bel- he belittled a person's life and recklessly made a vow, which was evil. Also, God is not the one who accepts a person as a sacrifice, nor did He command Iphtha to offer someone as a burning sacrifice. But as Iphtha made a vow for himself, and God knew that he would keep his vow, He granted victory to Israel. I will explain. He made such a vow out of his evil, and what he said after that was, were also evil. You may wonder, why did Father God listen to His vow and answer Him? You have to look, take a look at the situation. As I told you earlier, King Ahab did a lot of evil, but as he prayed, Father God listened to him. And as for i p t h a he suffered great trouble and distress for his vow, but he kept his vow. And looking at his heart, I mean, and God made, caused all things to get work together for good. When you have something to, just as senior pastor taught us, Uh, 
We have many things to please God. And, and we have to find out we can please God uh, by way of faithfulness, by loving our brothers and sisters, and giving health to others. As we do so, we can receive the most amazing blessings. Even if we fail to do so, sometimes we may say Father God I'm very lacking but why did you love me Some, but if Father God finds one thing good thing out of us He blesses us and i p t h a had a good heart of keeping His vow so even if He made such a wrong vow Father God answered him But as he returned home, the first one who welcomed him with tambourine and dancing was his lovely only daughter. What he said, what he vowed, he did receive answer by his vow, but to keep his vow, something unimaginable thing happened. Not one of his servants came out, but his own lovely daughter came out to welcome him back. So he had to offer her as a sacrifice. At this point, Ipta, it would have been good for Ipta to make a good confession. If Ipta had known the truth, he would have acted in a truthful way. My daughter, because I made a wrong vow, I have to have you killed. He had to admit his fault. But the Bible says, when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. It was his own fault that brought his daughter very low and troubled her, but he mentioned that she made him grieved and troubled. He continually revealed his evil that way. The reason that i p t h a suffered such grief was, was that he made, made an evil bow. To achieve his goal, he carelessly and hurriedly made a vow, risking a person's life. Consequently, he had to face enormous distress. Despite bearing such distress, Iptha kept his vow. He, even though he was in a situation where he had to sacrifice his daughter, he kept his vow. He said, I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Believing in God, he made sure to keep his vow. If we had broken this vow and had sacrificed, and hadn't sacrificed his daughter, you know, let's say he didn't keep his vow and didn't sacrifice his daughter, what would have happened? he would have suffered a greater trouble. As the enemy devil brought accusations for his breaking of the vow, he could have suffered a greater trouble than losing his own daughter. He could have, God could have completely turned his face away from him, or he couldn't have been saved. Knowing this, Iptha offered him offered his precious daughter as a burning sacrifice on account of his careless, selfish, and evil vow. Even though he knew that his vow was wrong, he kept it. And this was right. This proves how great the power of wars is, and then they can even make a person dead or alive. Therefore, we should be careful with our lips and refrain from ever speaking words causing Satan's accusations. In addition to abstaining from making vows carelessly, we should cast off all worthless words including complaints and negative judging and condemning words. 
Instead, we should utter only the words of truth and goodness, thereby bringing joy to God. Brothers and sisters, Gibeon that that made peace with Israel was a big and strong city like a capital of a kingdom. It was one of the major cities in the land of Canaan. The news that even the Gibeonites made peace with Israel frightened the neighboring Canaanites all the more. The fact that such a major city made peace made peace with Israel, frightened other tribes. The five Amorite kings residing near Gibeon quickly formed an alliance and attacked Gibeon before the Israelites arrived. Gibeon, it was like Gibeon betrayed them. They were also in opposition to Israel, but Gibeon went and made peace with Israel. That's why the the five kings attacked Gibeon. So the Gibeonites asked Israel for support. The alliance of the Amorites was actually a disadvantage to Israel. I will explain about this in the next session. You know, the alliance of other tribes, there were many tribes. We've learned that there were seven tribes in Canaan. But it doesn't mean that there were seven kings. You know, in ancient Korea, uh, we used to have three nations. You know, also in ancient China, there were numerous... The same way, Canaan had many cities. You know, there were united forces and... We may think there were only six cities and six kings, but it's not true. There were largely seven tribes, but actually there were numerous kings throughout Canaan. This is to help you understand better. Anyway, the neighboring cities around Gibeon attacked Gibeon. Actually, this was a disadvantage to Israel. You know, Israel was conquering cities one by one, but these united forces were attacking Israel, giving disadvantage to Israel. But for Israel that God was with, this was an opportunity to end the battles quickly. It would have agreed It would have required quite a long time to attack the Canaanite cities one by one. But by defeating the alliance of many kings, Israel was able to gain many cities at once. Receiving the request from Kibion, Israel quickly advanced to the city overnight and carried out a surprise attack against the united forces of the Amorites. The united forces were defeated and began to run away. And... Israel persistently pursued them to to utterly destroy them according to God's command. Because God helped them, because God was with them, because God had promised the land to them, because God had their back, Israel could easily gain victory. And And the United Forces were defeated and running away. And God manifested some marvelous work. As the Amorites were at the descent of Bethel Horn, gray stones from heaven suddenly rained down upon them. The Bible says, As they fled from before Israel, while they were at the descent of Bethel Horn, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. They didn't kill them with the sword and spear, but by by the marvelous work of Father God, they died with stones coming down from heaven. 
to give them victory, God used such methods. And throughout the history of Israel's battle, we we find such scenes. And in order to give victory to Israel, God helped them. You know, Israel was winning, and the enemy forces were running away because they could have run away and come back to attack them again. And God had commanded them to destroy them utterly. So Israel had to annihilate them. That's why God sent down great stones from heaven and hit and killed. This was a great work of God. But Israel couldn't just sit back in thrills. Once it got dark, it would become easy for enemies to hide, so they had to end the battle before the sunset. They shouldn't have, they couldn't have let them run away and hide. God, Father God, commanded them to destroy them utterly. Keeping this in mind, Joshua couldn't let them run away. Uh, Joshua didn't think that the battle was over, but Joshua fought with them to the end. But there were the enemy forces were numerous in number, so it required quite a long time to annihilate the numerous troops. Even though they were winning, their ultimate purpose was to destroy them completely because they were numerous in number. They they began to see the moon appearing in the east. At this point, Joshua displayed such amazing faith to carry out God's command completely. He proclaimed in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Azalon. If God hadn't instructed them to utterly destroy them, Joshua couldn't have prayed so. But God commanded him to utterly destroy them, and Joshua wanted to carry out the command. But as he was running out of time, Joshua offered such prayer of faith, and God listened to him, no matter how. And God listened to him and worked. No matter how powerful he is, a king in the world couldn't command the sun and the moon. Let alone command them, the Amorites even worshipped the sun, the moon, and natural phenomena like storms and rain. But as Joshua relied on God who governs all things, he could boldly command the sun and the moon, and the living God ensured his words. The Bible says, The sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Joskar? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. As Joshua commanded, God clothed the entire first heaven in the spiritual space. While the While the time flow of the spiritual realm applied to the entire first heaven, the time flow of the physical world became meaningless. While the sun and the moon were illuminating the sky, Joshua and the army of Israel slaughtered the united forces, almost annihilating them. By our common sense, stopping of the sun and the moon is totally impossible. But with the power of the Almighty God, nothing is impossible. We should believe in such great God. If you do so, you must have no worries. Even if you have worries in your life, you shouldn't complain, but believe in God who do such great things, who stop the moon and the sun. You have to ask Him to resolve your problems with joy and thanksgiving. You can just pray to Him. But why... Do you forget about God in your troubles? Why do you 
make confessions lacking faith? Why do you plant things which Father God is not pleased? Father God extended, manifests such amazing works so that we can rely on Him, on such great God. God shows that I am, I can do this. That's why whenever you have a trouble, you can rely on Him. Even if you suffer a trouble for not living by His word, if you ask Him to, if you repent and ask Him to resolve your problem, if you ask Him who stopped the sun and the moon, if you ask Him by faith to resolve your problem, you can stay joyful and thankful even if you are are in trouble right now. You shouldn't be discouraged. If only you have faith. You pray so, but after your prayer is over, you begin to complain and grumble. That is not true faith. That's why you have to check how you apply this message to your own life. Father God, who is great, is our own Father and manifests great works. Just as Jesus said, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Right now, Joshua is accomplishing God's work with such faith. Of course, God doesn't make such things happen at any time. The exact order of the universe maintained by His providence of the creation isn't to be confused so randomly. Nowadays, such works don't have to be manifested either. But if only God's children demonstrate spiritual faith When it's needed to fulfill God's providence, God can manifest even more amazing works than the stopping of the sun and the moon. The Bible describes the battle as follows. There was no day like that before or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. The reason that Joshua could boldly ask God was that he was not deviating from God's will. You know, Father God had commanded them to destroy them. To obey this command, Joshua was asking God to do that. And how great Joshua's faith was. Joshua hastily made a promise with the Hibonites. In the last session, he also made a mistake of attacking the city of Ai without asking God. Hearing this, you may think Joshua wasn't such a great person, but Joshua was a man of God. and he had great faith, thereby bringing down God's answer. But here, even even though he was a man of God, even though he lived by the word, he should have stayed humble, and he should have asked God. But you shouldn't think like, why did Joshua make the mistake twice? He was a person who brought down the work of stopping the sun and the moon. And through this work, we have to know that when we become a man of God, God works for us. Over the long hours while the sun stayed up, Israel almost annihilated the enemy forces and killed the five kings of the Amorites. Israel was unceasingly He drove them away, threatened, they kept on advancing, they continually advanced, quickly conquering the major cities in the southern Canaan. 
Also, the Bible says, Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea, even as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen, even as far as Gibeon. Joshua captured all the kings and their heads and their lands at one time because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. By doing so, Israel conquered most of the regions in the southern Canaan. Yet, it wasn't time to put themselves at ease or relax. Hearing of Israel's victory, the kings of the east and the west, the north and south, allied and came together, raising all the armies for a battle against Israel. Over the vast land of Canaan, the kings of that land raised all their armies for a fight against Israel. The Bible says they came out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore, the Bible is describing the enemy forces, with very many horses and chariots, so all of these kings have agreed to meet, came and encamped together at the waters of Merom and to fight against Israel. God has sent down stones and stopped the sun and the moon. How do you think God worked this time? We will discuss this in the next session. Now, things are process, being processed quickly as the Canaanites saw Kibonites making peace with Israel. They allied with each other and attacked Israel, and Israel won great victory. When Israel won great victory, God sent down great stones from heaven and stopped the sun and the moon, answering Joshua's bold faith, prayer of bold faith, and also God helped them to conquer most of the major cities in the southern Canaan. But, but all this didn't happen overnight. It wasn't, the battle didn't last just one year or two years. You have to understand their situation. There was a long... This is about a record. Uh, but we have to learn how God destroyed numerous enemy troops and how Joshua brought down marvelous works of God. You have to keep them in mind. Brothers and sisters, Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. As he said, throughout the human cultivation, God has always manifested his amazing works beyond man's imagination. Whenever his children ask him by faith, his works include miracles at the Red Sea, and the Jordan River, destruction of Jericho, and the stopping of the sun and the moon, which we talked about today. We've also become more convinced that the Bible is true, always experiencing amazing biblical signs and wonders throughout the history of Ma Min. This is the evidence of God being with our shepherd. By the way, if we indeed believe all this, we have to make sure to Keep this in mind. The Grand Sanctuary and the Word Evangelization relate to our sanctification. It is not a separate matter. Fulfillment of the providence of the end time is not done just by the shepherd on whom God bestowed His power. It also requires many people with spiritual faith, namely spiritual, spiritual warriors. s e n i o r Pastor emphasized this Time and again, he said that this is not done by my faith. By my faith alone, I, we could have achieved the construction of the Grand Sanctuary. But what Father God wants from us is the sanctification of the church members. And what He has he had shown is the great power of God. And we believe that was true and has been following Him. And Now we have to keep them in our mind 
all the more strongly and we have to try to each and every one of you should become such a warrior, spiritual warrior. Spiritual faith by which we can manifest God's work is given as much as we achieve holiness and gain boldness by offering fervent prayers and arming ourselves with the words. Please ask yourself, how much have I cultivated my heart? In light of the Beatitudes, Spiritual Love Chapter, the Nine Fruits of the Holy Spirit, and the Fruits of Light, how much have I touched and edified the others and glorified God as the light and salt? Am I able to manifest God's works and proclaim the gospel of holiness before many people out in the world? If you are really prepared to do that, didn't God still answer you and bless you and use as His precious vessel? It's because you've lacked your preparation. And you shouldn't say, why Father God Why isn't Father God answering us? We have to meet the qualification, meet the condition. The problem lies in us, and we have to recover ourselves. If you find yourself lacking, please make up your mind about what you have to do. It is to diligently adorn yourself as His bride with prayer and the Word. This is the most important thing for us. As we do so, our prayer topics will be answered. Some of you may say, why haven't we received the answer? We have to check whether we have, meet, we have met the conditions Father God presented. By doing so, I pray in our Lord's name that when the time arrives for God's explosive works, many of you can confess as warriors of faith, Here I am, send me. Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers and those who are watching via satellites, cables, and the Internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues, and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. Be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases such as colds and fever, go away from them. Protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells, and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby, 
bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bonds of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit with the heavenly host and angels and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God, and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.